There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. What if you have a girl in school that does not believe in God? What should I do about this? This is written by a child. And I would certainly say that the most important thing you can do about it is to act like a Christian. Don't try to talk her into becoming a Christian. What should I do about this? When I talk about God to try to get them to believe in God, she tells me to be quiet. So I try again again and, and again. And every time she says, be quiet, and she gets more and more upset. So finally I quit because she says, shut up and run off. By all means, shut up. <laughs> but in your action, in the way you do your schoolwork, in your response to your teacher, in your courtesy to this girl, in your smiling to at her or maybe offering her a cookie out of your lunch or something, in little ways, just ask the Lord to show you ways in which you can love her without saying a word. What we, what we are is always much more powerful than what we say. That's why I pray so, I ask you to pray so earnestly that the Lord will not allow me to be merely a talker because I talk a lot and you listen to me talk. But the great question is, how do I act? What is it that God sees where nobody else sees? I would like to maintain my children's innocence as long as possible. When do you recommend talking to your children about marital sexual relations? Do you recommend that husband and wife talk together with their daughter or just mom and vice versa with sons? My mother, I prayed from until I was seven years old, I prayed desperately that God would give us a, a, a sister. I had two brothers and I thought that was plenty. I thought that was more than enough. And so I was praying that the Lord would give me a sister. And so one day, my mother told me that, oh, before my mother told me anything, I went to my mother and, and asked her why we don't get another baby. And she said, well, maybe we will sometime. Well, there was a baby hospital down the street from where we lived, and so I suggested that mother could go there to get one, because that's where I thought they all came from. And so when she did become pregnant in answer to my prayers, um, she took me aside and told me that the Lord was going to answer my prayer, was going to give us a baby. We didn't know whether it was going to be a boy or a girl, but the baby was inside her. And that was really all I needed to know. That was my one and only fact, and that's all I needed to know. I had no idea that my father had anything to do with it. So uh, the most important answer to this question is don't tell your children more than you think they need to know. At, a, at any given time, and it takes wisdom from God. In today's world, of course, who knows what they're learning in school. If, if they go to a public school, it may be first grade when they're learning all kinds of stuff. We, we, I think we got more than enough questions. We've got them until about five o'clock this afternoon, but <laughs> uh, so listen, if you have, there are a lot of them that are duplicates, but uh, you know, if you hear something near your question, why listen up a little bit more? I've got to unfold them. But say what you normally say to begin with, which you didn't do. He says, say what you normally say to begin with. So I didn't say it to begin with. But I will try to give you a scriptural answer, of course. I will have to give you a brief answer. So I hope you will not be, feel offended if you think that I gave you short shrift. I don't mean to be taking lightly any of your questions, but I have to try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, I think it's best for the father to talk to his sons and a mother to talk to the daughter for the first lessons in, on sex. Uh, as they get into teenage, then of course you can have family conversations about it. And it's very important that you ask God to help you to discern when they need to know these things. God will give you wisdom if you ask of him. How can we love family members who have committed crimes without condoning their lifestyles? 
Well, that's a good question. There's, we should never confuse love with condoning. Christ loved us while we were yet sinners. He did not condone what we did. He had to die for it. And you and I may have to die figuratively in all kinds of ways in order to love somebody whose behavior is anathema to you, whose behavior is totally unacceptable. If you get my newsletter, you might remember that uh, last year, I guess it was, I asked for prayer for the Paul Hill family. Paul Hill is the man who shot an abortion doctor. He is a Presbyterian pastor, and he's on death row in Florida, and he listens to my program, and he's written me a number of letters. And he has no remorse that he shot the abortion doctor because he felt it was something that God wanted him to do. All I did was ask in my newsletter, would you please pray for the Paul Hill family because they are Christians. The, mother, the wife has sent me several letters, sent me a picture of the family, just a lovely family. Well, I got letters, four or five letters from readers of my, of my newsletter saying, how can you condone what Paul Hill did? Well, I tried to point out that asking for prayer for somebody has nothing to do with condoning it. So loving somebody is not in any way condoning the sin. And if it's a family member, they probably know how you feel about what they've done. If they know what your standards are, what the scriptures say, then they already know. So you don't have to go into that, nor need they ever think that because you're being loving to them, that you condone what they do. What authors have been an inspiration to you? I'll just name three. We could go on and on, but Amy Carmichael has had the most profound influence in my spiritual life of any Christian author. Uh, I would say George MacDonald is next, and C.S. Lewis is third. All of them instruct me continually. I'm reading, I'm reading George MacDonald over and over again. What is your definition of the sovereignty of God? It means that God is in total control of everything that happens. He is the Lord of the universe. Nothing can happen without God's permission. To me, that's the most calming, fortifying doctrine that I know. There is nothing to worry about. God is not worried about anything. He is working on a pattern which the Bible tells us is meant for good. Romans 8.28 says everything that happens fits into a pattern for good to them that love God. And of course, our instant question is, but Lord, how can this thing fit into any pattern for good? He's not going to answer that question. He has told us it does. He has not told us how it does. Re recently, attention has been drawn to the plight of persecuted Christians in the world. Have you had contact with suffering Christians in your travels? What should American Christians do to help them? I have had, I can't remember having any contact with suffering Christians who are suffering now. Of course, we have traveled in Europe, and I know that there have been suffering Christians in Ecuador, but the people that we've met were pe people who had endured suffering, yes. Um, what should American Christians do to help them? It is overwhelming to think of all the things that are going on. There have been more Christian martyrs in the last 50 years than in all Christian history before that. Did you know that? There have been at least 100,000 Christian martyrs in China alone. Nobody has any count of the number that were killed in the Sudan. And of course it's going on now. There's concentration camps in Bosnia. The things that are going on in Rwanda are unbelievable. I think you just have to pray you can pray broadly and widely, but you can also pray specifically. Just ask the Lord to bring to your attention individuals or particular places that God wants you to pray about. Uh, there are organizations that you can support that are trying to help them, and by all means support such organizations. I'm helping my husband of one and a half years to raise two sons, 11 and 12. They are my stepsons, and I love them very much. My husband and I are trying to raise them in good Christian homes. Their natural mother has moved to town, 
and is letting them see her more often. She is not saved and has convinced them that being a Christian and going to church is not something they have to take part in. They don't go to church when they stay with her and complain when we pray, read the Bible, or go to church. Do you have any suggestions for us? That's a very tough one, and of course it's not one that I've ever had to deal with. But God has an answer. And because you and your husband are Christians and have a responsibility to answer to God for the training that your boys get, never mind whatever negative training they're getting from the other side, uh, try to be as casual, as calm and pleasant as you can when you explain to your sons, yes, I know that your mother does things this way and she believes other things. This is what we believe, and this is why we believe it. And just feed them the word of God, teach them to pray, and try to be cheerful about it, and just say, and and we all go to church as a family, and we don't want you to miss out on some things that you may not think are very interesting now, but someday you're going to be thankful. Above all, pray for wisdom. Just pray and pray and pray for wisdom. Pray that the Lord will enable you as a stepmother uh, to love the birth mother. I don't know if you have any contact with her, but God will have to give you the answers. Does turning the other cheek mean that we must keep putting ourselves back in the way of a person who continually hurts us? Sometimes yes and sometimes no, but God will have to show you your particular situation. Can we as Christians justify the act of disassociation? Paul was extremely strong on certain things about which he said that the, or with which he said that the Christians in the church were to have nothing to do. And that has been a very hard question for me uh, in certain situations where I felt that someone was absolutely wrong in doing what they did and they were people that were claiming to be Christians. And there are several places where Paul says you're not even to eat with them. You are not to welcome them into your fellowship and you're not to eat with them. I think that perhaps that is limited to a church resolution. It's something that has to be taken to the elders in the church and let them decide as to what degree of disassociation there can be. If it's a member of the family, there's no way you can dissociate yourself. And that goes for the first question, too. If you're putting yourself in the way of a person who continually hurts you, if that person happens to be your husband, obviously you have to continually put yourself in his way, but try to do it in as gracious a way as Mrs. G did. Is it right to cut off someone, father, brother, friend, in order to avoid verbal and emotional abuse? I think it's wrong. I think you ought to be willing to take the verbal and emotional abuse. Remember that Jesus was reviled and reviled not again. He opened not his mouth. So you continue to pour out love and continue to get contempt poured on you. So what else is new? If we're going to be his followers, we have to take up the cross. To deny oneself for the love of Christ is very difficult, especially when we have been very hurt. How could we expect to be followers of one who took up the cross and not be hurt. How could we possibly imagine that the taking up of the cross is not going to mean suffering? It means suffering. Maybe my book, A Path Through Suffering, would be helpful to you because I've tried to show in there that out of deepest suffering, God can bring deepest joy. How can we forgive and find healing and peace in our hearts when our hearts are so heavy with pain. Let me give you what has been a very liberating little gesture in my life. Get down on your knees, lift up your empty hands, and put that pain figuratively into your hands. But it helps me to take this physical action and just say, Lord, you know the pain of my heart. You know what that person did. I I cannot handle this pain. I am going to give it to you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I will not retrieve it. And you just give that pain over to God. 
It is an act of surrender. The enemy is going to be there instantly, and he's going to whisper in your ear, do you think that worked? Do you think God was listening? Do you feel real good about that person now? And of course, the, the answer is no. You don't feel any, any different than you did five minutes ago. But the point is, you have given that pain to Jesus Christ, and you are not going to act in accordance with your pain. You are going to change your attitude, and you are going to start loving that person. But it will only come by the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you have got to make that surrender. Relinquish the anger and the pain and the hurt. And if you have to get down on your knees 50 times in one day to do that, go ahead. And if Satan whispers in your ear, I don't turn around and talk to Satan. I don't want to talk to Satan. I just say, Lord, you heard what he said. I'm going to let you handle this. I have a friend who has been beaten up by her husband and has been advised to leave him. She has left him but feels guilty for the breakup of her marriage. Do you think she should go back to him? She has two young daughters. I can never escape those questions. And of course, I cannot give you the answer. The scripture is very plain on most things. It does not say specifically that you are to leave your husband. And I never feel that I can... Uh, recommend abandonment or divorce. I believe that you can trust God to show you what you are supposed to do. How do you cope with a medical condition which has no cure yet it is not life-threatening? This problem has caused several problems which includes my work, marriage, and life. I pray for an answer which does not seem to come. Many seem to care yet do not understand since no one else has this medical condition. I feel bad to hate what I am going through, since so many people are worse off than me with other problems, yet I've gone through such pain. What's the best way to handle a problem which you don't look, when, which you don't look sick, but causes many problems? The same way, everything in my life, I want to be an offering to Jesus Christ. It's not difficult to make the writing of a book, or the acceptance of a speaking engagement, or the preparation of a radio program to be an offering to Jesus Christ. That's not very hard. But it is very hard to make this kind of thing an offering. But it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Every time that pain is, again, evident in your life, every time you're reminded of it, and every time you feel guilty because you see somebody in a wheelchair who's much worse off than you are, Offer your pain to God. God is the one who measures out exactly the amount of suffering that you and I need in order to become conformed to the image of Christ. And if this is a small thing which nevertheless needles you constantly, accept it as a small thing. And there are small things in my life that you don't hear about on the radio and that I don't put into my books. But these are the givens. Let me not stew over the fact of the not givens. Do you have any suggestions on how we can worship in church as a family with a one-year-old when the church discourages having children with you during the service? Well, of course, the only reason that the church discourages you from having children in the service is that most young parents haven't a clue about keeping a one-year-old quiet. You must train the child at home. Obviously, one day a week when he's in church, he's not going to sit quietly if you haven't trained him to sit quietly at home. And I had a letter not very long ago from a woman who gave a marvelous little recipe for how to do this. When her son was about five months old, she began to train him to rest. And by this, she meant that she would take him on her lap, facing her, and she took a hold of his arms and held them strongly, but not squeezing him too hard, and just looked him straight in the face and said, Jeremy, rest. And of course, Jeremy is flailing and furious and screaming. And she said, this went on. She said, as soon, if, as, soon as he would tar- start to s- flail and scream, then I would start over on the five-minute timing, because I wanted it to be only five minutes each time. So she would tell him again, it's time to rest. We are going to rest. And she said she had to do this sometimes up to 20 minutes or so. 
And she did it every day for two whole weeks. And she said, believe me, he screamed his head off. He was absolutely furious. He was red in the face. But at the end of two weeks, he had learned what it means to rest. And she said, I can take him anywhere. I can take him to church. I can take him to a friend's house. I can take him to any place where he has to be perfectly quiet and he knows what the word means. Now, my parents required that we sit still at family prayers. We had family prayers twice a day. We had to sit still. We had to sit still at the table. There was never any jumping up and down from the table. We were never allowed to go and get another glass of milk without asking permission. And we had to sit still in the car. And there were no seat belts in those days. You can train your child. So that is my strongest suggestion. What I would love to say is that the preacher ought to be preaching this from the pulpit because nobody is saying these things. And everybody's just taking it for granted. Oh, they're just little kids, you know. They, they don't, they, they, you can't expect them to sit still. Of course you can expect them to sit still if you train them. Children live up to your expectations. If you think they're going to be little devils, they will most certainly live up to your expectations. How do you feel on herbs instead of medicine? I feel God gave us herbs to help with most illness, but what does the Bible say to us about our diets? The Bible is very clear about certain things. And of course, in the Old Testament, they had dietary rules that didn't apply in the New Testament. But Paul said, eat whatever is put in front of you without asking any questions. Don't ask a whole lot of questions. I think, of course, I agree that herbs were given to us for medicine. And I have a great friend who was a missionary in Colombia, and she collected herbal remedies for 50 years. She's still collecting them. And she says she's seen them work wonders. But God has also allowed man to discover penicillin and some other things. Do you think a relationship can succeed if there is a 17-year age difference? The man is 17 years older than the woman. Guess what? My second husband was 18 years older than I. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's no question in my mind that the marriage can certainly succeed. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yes, if the woman is 18 and the man is 17 years older, I would say, forget it. If the woman is 38 years old and the man is 20, forget it. You have to be reasonable if you're, when you're young. Now, of course, I was already in my 40s when I married my second husband. So there was no question of whether he wanted more children or didn't want any more children or whether I wanted more children because we were not in that age bracket. The older you get, the less difference it makes. But I never would recommend that there'd be a huge difference between, say, a, a 20 year old, uh, say, a 25 year old man who wants to marry a 35 year old woman. If he wants a family, it can't be a very big one, can it? And maybe she doesn't want to have any children or whatever. Things like that have to be taken into account. Could you briefly tell us of your courtship or the events leading up to the decision to marry Lars? <laughs> well, it was a very. What? He's saying, make it short. Okay. <laughs> Lars was a lodger in my house for two years. I took in two seminary students after my second husband died. The first one married my daughter. The second one married me. <laughs> and when I told my friend, who, but 76 years old, who had lost her one and only husband, she's from Texas, told her my story. She said, I believe I'm going to rent my house out to three widowers. <laughs> my friend lost her mother four days after her first child was born. If you could just offer her some comforting words, she's having a hard time. Hard times are suffering. Suffering is suffering. And I would give you 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Those were the words that most comforted me when my first husband died. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. What Bible version were you reading from? NIV, New International Version. I'm having trouble choosing a version, help. There are lots of good ones, and I often quote from other versions from memory, so I'm not always sure that I'm quoting from NIV. 
just happens to be the one that I'm reading now. I strongly recommend J.B. Phillips' translation of the New Testament. I love that. And New English Bible is wonderful. Um, there are many good ones. I know this may be way off the subject of what you are addressing today, but it has been upon my heart to ask if possible. It is about birth control, the pill. Is it wrong? Yes, I would never recommend the pill because it does uh, prevent the implantation of the fertilized egg. So it is abortion. It's not the prevention of conception. It is the destruction of conception. Okay, there's a bunch of questions about natural family planning. Birth control, how many children to have? Can you space your children? How long do you have to wait before you have children? Or is it right to wait? All of those things, I would say, must be referred to God. I deplore the attitude that says, we're going to have two kids, period, no more, and that's it. Let's not dictate to God. You may be missing the greatest blessing imaginable. I often say to people who have big families, you have done your children a very big favor. It's a wonderful thing to see children grow up in a big, big family because they cannot get away with being selfish. They cannot get away with being discourteous. They have to learn the sacrifice of love. It is just, you can't survive as in a big family otherwise. So I recommend natural family planning, which is a method that God has built into the reproductive system. So it seems reasonable to me that that can be made use of under the will of God. Ask God if it's all right to space the children a little bit or to set a cutoff point. Be very cautious before you do that. My husband is not saved, but is very active in, the de in a dead church that we are members of. Trying to be a godly wife and mother, I attend church with him and my family and participate as I can, as God allows. What advice can you give me? There, where there is a church, a Bible teaching church that I love. It's alive and wonderful and teaches the word of God to all. I want us to be there. What to do? Keep going to church with your husband. The other church is not given, and I would not feel that I'm in any position to tell you that you, you can disobey your husband and go someplace else. If that's where he wants you to be, you can still worship God in that church, no matter whether what's coming out of the pulpit is thoroughly biblical or not. It is the house of God, and you can worship there. A close relative disclosed, disclosed to me that they are homosexual. This person was raised in a Christian home, has an excellent education, and confesses to be a Christian. I believe that they know that homosexuality is a sin, but believes that since the Bible isn't perfectly clear on this, that scripture can be interpreted to support their belief. What is your view on this? this scripture is crystal clear. <laughs> Absolutely crystal clear. Homosexuality is classified along with <laughs> murder, and adultery and everything else. It's just, it's in that list of sins. But if you think that homosexuality is a genetic disorder, which scientists have not proved yet, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but what would give a, a homosexual person who claims that he was born that way, what gives him the right to be sexually active when God has made it crystal clear that the only place for sexual activity is in the marriage bed. You single women, you do not have an area in which you can exercise your sexual desires. They have to be brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. What gives the homosexual the right to think that he has a special dispensation to sleep with members of the same sex? God deplores it. He hates it. Now, this is so much like so many questions that I get. How do you love a husband who has so-and-so? This one has been into pornography. How do we love any sinner as Christ loves us? Everything that I've tried to say this morning is the how. I told you how Mrs. G did it. I told you how Jim, Jim did it. I've told you what the Bible says. I've told you about the man with the withered hand. 
How in the world is a man with a withered hand supposed to stretch it out? He did what Jesus told him. So I have no other answer. Pornography is one of the many sins of which a husband may be guilty. My husband has had a vasectomy. It has thrown me in a tailspin. Have you received letters from other women that have experienced this and been affected in the same way? I can't be intimate with him anymore. But you must be. You have no right to tell your husband that you cannot be intimate with him because of what he did. The Bible clearly tells us in 1 Corinthians 7 that we are not to defraud one another. For a husband to refuse to have sex with his wife is disobedience. For a wife to refuse her husband is disobedience. How do I get through this? In the power of the Lord of the universe, the omnipotence of love. I don't know how many times I can say it, and I don't know any other way to say it, but God will enable you to do what God wants you to do. God wants you to love your husband. And it, you, you have no idea, by your loving him and doing everything that your husband wants, it might change his mind. He might think, you know, we really ought to have another baby. And he would go and get a reversal. You don't know what God may have up his sleeve. What is the difference between biblical love and what is called codependency? There isn't the slightest connection. Codependency is another one of those buzzwords, you know. We're all codependent. I am so dependent on Lars, I cannot even imagine what I would do without him. And he is so dependent on me, he can't imagine what he would do without me. I mean, we are codependent. But that has nothing to do with biblical love. My codependency is not going to help me much when I'm angry with him. Um, (laughs) It's one of these psychological words that we're taught to believe is very dangerous. I just forget about it. What is the difference between loving your enemy and being a doormat? I don't see much difference between loving your enemy and being a doormat. Jesus, in Philippians 2, we have a description of what Jesus did. He made himself nothing. The word actually means he annihilated himself. And to me, that's less than a doormat. A doormat is something. But Jesus was willing to be walked all over. He was reviled and reviled not again. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. That is the Savior we follow. That is the one who took up the cross. These are not going to be popular messages. Never were in Jesus' time. Very few people followed him to the end. And I don't expect that my message is going to be a popular one. Of course not, because it cuts absolutely across everything in our sinful flesh. Do you recommend a good book to help teach my children courtesy and manners? Well, I'm very thankful for that one, because we just happen to have a book there at the book table called, uh, what's it called? (laughs) Uh, It's written by my great-grandfather, and it is... What? Hints on child training. Thank you. He was my great-grandfather, and of course, my, one of his daughters was my grandmother. And he has some wonderful hints on child training there, and, and very old-fashioned, but very much, very relevant to today's world. What is the role of men in initiating and pursuing a life's companion, and how do you do this and keep your eyes on the prize? I, pre- I don't know, what, this must be a man that wrote this if he says, how do you do this? Uh, because it's only men that are supposed to be the initiators and the pursuers. The prize, of course, is Jesus Christ. If God wants you to be married, whether you're a man or a woman, God knows how to bring you together with the right person. And that's what my book, Quest for Love, is about. It's stories of the ways in which God has brought men and women together. And there are some horror stories in there about women who have done the initiating and the disaster that that has led to. How can I find a wife and still follow the Lord wholeheartedly? The very first chapter in my book, Quest for Love, is the story of a man who was desperately trying to find a wife. And God didn't let him find her until he was, I think he was about 30 years old, 
And then he, he, he discovered why God had not let him find her sooner, because when he first started looking for a wife, she was in the fourth grade. <laughs> God knows where she is. God knows how to bring her together with you. But of course, you have to do what Abraham's servant did when he was looking for a wife for Isaac. Pray silently. Watch quietly. You do not need to date. You need to pray that God will bring you the right woman at the right time. And there is story after story after story in that book of the ways in which God does it. And he has a thousand ways of doing it. It's not going to be the same necessarily, but trust him. If everything that I say on the radio, everything that I write in my books, everything that I say from a platform were condensed into two words, it would always be trust and obey. Trust and obey. He will help you. As a man of God, I'm called to keep my f focus solely on the Lord, not looking to the right or the left. If I start thinking of or becoming the initiator with a girl, I lose my focus. How do I look only to God and not remain single for the rest of my life? Read Genesis 24. It is the story of Abraham's servant. He had to look. He went to the place where it was perfectly proper to observe women with propriety. And it says he prayed silently and he watched quietly. If you believe God wants to give you a wife, then you have to watch. Just watch the women in the church. Watch, are they feminine? It's extremely important that we be as feminine as we can possibly be. And that means you've got to get rid of the unisex look. Is she a Christian? Is she the kind of woman that you would like to see at the other end of your table when you were entertaining your favorite friends or your family? Is she a woman open to having a family? These are all simple, obvious questions. But God will show you. What are we to learn about the gift of children and birth control? Give up your right, this is another question, give up your right to yourself. How do I give up the right to myself and pursue my spouse when I'm looking for myself as I look for a spouse? If this is a woman that wrote this, don't look. But if it's a man, I think I've answered that question. We women are not to be the initiators. If you wonder why I say that, please read my book, Let Me Be a Woman. That explains everything I have to say about femininity. And the mark of a man is what I have to say on the subject of masculinity. Please comment on the role of guys in courting and initiating relationship. We brought 11 guys to this meeting today? Must be. Well, that's wonderful. The role of men is the same as the role of Christ. He is the initiator. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. He laid down his life. And he loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ is the head of the church. A man is the head of his wife as Christ is head of the church. It's a mystery. We women represent the bride of Christ. The man represents Christ himself, and that's why I'm to submit to him, because he stands in the place of Christ. And it is Christ who wooed and called and won us. And so it is the man's job to woo and to call and to win a woman. I had a lovely experience a few years ago. Lars and I were in some place in the South, and after the meeting, when all the autograph seekers had left. There was still a small group of young people that obviously were together, and they were waiting till the end. And a very sweet-looking young girl and young guy came up to me, and the man just sort of knelt down at my feet. I was sitting on a chair, and he wanted to introduce me to his girlfriend, and he told me what a wonderful girl she was and all this, and she's blushing and smiling. And I said, are you engaged? And he jumped and he said, oh no, he said, we're not engaged, you know, and she blessed you more. And I said, but don't you consider her exactly the kind of woman you're looking for for a wife? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what are you waiting for? And he said, the right time and the right place. Well, I said, what's wrong with now, here? <laughs>
And he got down on his knees in front of the girl and he said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. And of course, they, all the friends that were standing around cheered and clapped and everybody hugged. And of course, we thought, we'll never see them again. And about three months later, I said to Lars, I wonder whatever happened to that sweet little couple. It must have been a horrible disaster and who knows if anything happened. What a terrible thing to do. And the very next day, I got the wedding invitation and I now have a picture of them with a the baby. Advice for someone who has found a relationship with Christ when they were a young adult but grew up in a non-Christian home. My parents still do not believe. You can't blame your adult choices on your parents. So now I presume that this person is an adult, or certainly thinking like an adult, or you wouldn't be asking the question. Um, pray for them and demonstrate in your walk what a Christian looks like. Why do you think so many women are dissatisfied with their marriages? Because we're sinners. That's why. What are we expecting? Perfection? Yes. We're not going to get it. Or related, why do women in general seem to be so angry with men in general? Sin is the answer. Sin on the part of the men and the women. Of course, we get angry and we sin and if a sinful man and a sinful woman are going to live together 365 days a year in the bond of marriage, there's going to be many an occasion when you have to say, please forgive me, and many an occasion when we have to say, you're forgiven. I know that your radio program ministers to men as well as women, but how do you feel about teaching men? And what do you think the Bible teaches about women teaching men in the church? To me, there is a great distinction between my writing a book and broadcasting on the radio and teaching men. No man has to re read the book. No man has to turn on the radio. But in the church, this is the local visible sign of the invisible reality of the kingdom of God. And the man who stands in the pulpit represents Christ to the church. He is the one to whom authority has been given, and the rest of the men in the church are also given authority. We women are not to usurp authority in either the church or the home. That's why we're to submit to our husbands, because of the mystery. It has nothing to do with competence. A woman may be a far better preacher than a man. That doesn't give her a warrant to stand up and preach in the pulpit. But we are to be in subjection because we represent the bride of Christ. They are to be in authority because they represent Christ himself. How can we younger women encourage the older women to teach and encourage us as in the Bible? I appreciate that question because there seems to me to be a permanent standoff on this matter of Titus 2, 3 to 5. It says there that the older women are to teach the younger women. And they're to teach them to love their husbands, to love their children, to stay home, and a whole lot of other things, in order that the word of God may not be maligned. And the older women are complaining to me, saying the younger women don't want to hear our advice. And the younger women are complaining to me, the older women are not making themselves available. So let's just have a show of hands here right now. A few women, let's say, under 40, who would be willing to listen to the advice of women over 40. Would you put your hand up? Look at this. Okay, you women who are over 40, who are willing to make yourselves available if anybody wants your advice, let's see your hands. You see, there's no need for the standoff. That, my answer to the question is, let it be known. And the most important way that I can think of that you might let it be known in your church would be something very simple. God forbid that we start another meeting in your church. Do not start a club. Do not have a newsletter. Do not start a meeting. Put up a piece of paper on the bulletin board with your name and just say, these are the older available women in this church. Call me. <laughs> and down at the bottom say, obviously, these women cannot all be available all the time. There will be times when you cannot be available. But suppose there were four women in a church that would say, I'd be glad to answer a question about how to potty train a two-year-old 
or I can tell you how to, tur- how to cook a turkey. These are, they don't have to be spiritual things, but very often they lead to that, don't they? So that's the way you can make it known that you want to be available. And the, you women, younger women, can go to the older women and say, I am open to any advice you want to give me. Maybe an older woman has noticed the terrible behavior of your child in church. You need help. And very likely she can give it to you. So we need to fulfill Titus 2, 3 to 5. Now here's a caution. Every one of you women is an older woman. Here's a girl on the front row with glasses and a black sweater or something. How old are you? She is 11. She is an older woman to a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or a three-year-old. Because I remember when I was nine, my next-door neighbor was 15. And I was, we moved to a new area, and I was very shy. I didn't have any friends, and I was very lonely. And this 15-year-old girl was such a sweet, loving, outgoing person. She became a spiritual mother to me. And I want to say to every single one of you that you are, ought to be a spiritual mother to somebody, no matter what your age is. Of course, I think Paul was talking about what we usually think of as the older women and the younger women, but let's not absolve ourselves of responsibility to be an example to someone younger. How do I make my husband understand that because I do love him so much, when he is hurting deep down, is a bit cranky towards me and the kids, that I, too, am hurting for him. It breaks my heart to see him hurting so much and not share it with me. That's because all the trouble that's making him hurt has to do with him at work. I love him dearly with all my heart, and I try to let him know that as often as I can. I would appreciate some advice on this matter if you can give it to me. I think that it is a mistake to try to dredge out of your husband whatever it is that's bothering him. You probably have some idea of it, but you don't know all of it. It's much better to just be cheerful and extra kind, make his favorite pie for him, fix his favorite meal, be as sweet as you possibly can to him in bed, but don't ask him any questions. If he wants to tell you, he'll tell you, but the chances are he doesn't want to tell you, and he doesn't want you to be prying. I understand the question. I understand how much it breaks my heart when I know my husband is suffering over something that he doesn't want to talk about. But he may be one without a word being spoken. Another question on communication. I guess that's one of the biggest things. I remember hearing Oprah Winfrey say one time, if I hear that word communication one more time, it's the main complaint that women have. And if your husband doesn't want to communicate, leave him alone. We're there to make life easy and simple and pleasant, not to be their moral custodians. What does a wife do if she stays and prays for years and all her husband does is ridicule her for praying and tells her she doesn't need to read the Bible because it doesn't do her any good anyway? Try to do your praying and your Bible reading in private. Don't let him see you do it. Let him think you don't pray anymore. It won't hurt him any worse than what he's doing is already hurting him. So I would say, don't, whatever you do, don't make a show of reading your Bible. If he happens to catch you at it, of course, you don't need to apologize. But I think we could be a little bit more tactful. Many Christian women in my family, myself included, plus friends of mine, have given themselves so completely to family that they have lost all sense of self. I can't think of anything more wonderful. We do not need to know who we are. The great German philosopher Goethe said, only God knows who I am, and may God preserve me from ever finding out. (laughs) That is exactly my sentiments. As for your gifts, God is going to show you what your gifts are through the assignments that he gives you. People come and ask me, what are your spiritual gifts? I don't know. I've never sat down and tried to figure out what my gifts were. It was because writing a book was something which was providentially dropped in my lap. 
that I found out that I could write a book. I didn't know that before. So because I wrote a book, then somebody thinks I can talk, and so they asked me to come and speak. But it, wasn't, it never crossed my mind that I was supposed to go after it. It was when I was a senior in college or junior in college that I was praying desperately for God's confirmation as to whether or not I was to be a foreign missionary. I had hoped and prayed all my life that God would let me be a foreign missionary. But I thought, maybe this, this is my own idea. Maybe that's not what God wants. And so I was praying about it, and it became very obvious to me through my grades that God had given me a gift in linguistics. And it was then that I learned that there were 2,000 languages in the world that had never been reduced to writing. And so I said, well, Lord, I'm available. If you want me to do that kind of work, that's what I'll do. And that's what I did. I went to Ecuador. I had taken linguistic training, but I was not with Wycliffe Bible Translators. But I worked in three different Indian languages. So God knows how to reveal your gifts. You don't need to go out looking for them. And if you have a full-time job at home, taking care of your family and your children, that is your gift. You, are, you have the gift of being a wife, and the gift of being a mother, and the gift of cooking and laundry and all the rest of it. And you may say, well, I'm not a very good cook. I would say, well, try to be a better one. Get some good recipe books. Lost my husband a few months ago in a car accident. Through his death, I found the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an example of joy that comes out of deep suffering. I'm still in pain, but through intense Bible doctrine, I have found hope and peace. However, will I ever get over the pain? If you live long enough, yes. As my step-grandmother used to say, you can get used to hanging if you live long enough. <laughs> but this was only a few months ago, remember, and she says, even in my pain, I feel that had my husband not died, I would never have come to Christ. I love my husband more than ever now and consider his death and my suffering a blessing from God. Thank God for such an attitude and such a revelation of what Jesus Christ can do. How many times have you been married? Three, and all of them uh, to wonderful Christian men, so I can't identify with all the terrible stories that I hear. Uh, I was married to Jim for only 27 months. I was married to Ad for four and a half years, and Lars and I will have been married 19 years in December. Um, I have one child only by my first husband. I have three stepchildren by my second husband, and um, my daughter has made me a very rich grandmother because she has eight children. By the way, tell that one guy the game is on TV tonight, primetime sports. <laughs> Is there a difference between male ego and male pride? Not that I know of. <laughs> How many children would you have liked to have had if Jim Elliot had not died? I would love to have had, oh, probably at least six. Did you and Jim talk about it before your marriage? Yes, we were definitely planning on having a large family. Would you have let God decide, even if that had been 12 or more children? I certainly hope I would have. Should you let God control this area of your life? Yes. How do, you with un how do you withstand what the world says? We have to withstand what the world says about everything. You could just assume that any, any notion that has taken captive the imagination of the world is rubbish. That's a good place to start. It might be right. There might be some wisdom that you get from the world, but generally speaking, it's best to come at it with great reservations. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today, and will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>